From around the Beltway to around the world, this is The Daily Drum on 96.3 WHUR. Plus, now every Wednesday on WHUT-TV, bringing you the information you need that matters most. Better together. Here's Harold Fisher. Good evening. This is The Daily Drum for Wednesday, December 13th. Here's what's happening. A monumental shift in the DMV sports world is in the works. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin announcing the plan this morning to lure the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards to Alexandria's Potomac Yard neighborhood. We have a plan to unleash a brighter, more extraordinary future. And as part of this amazing project, we will build a spectacular $2 billion sports and entertainment district. Yunkin was joined by Monumental Sports CEO Ted Leonsis to unveil the public-private partnership. This deal would create a 70-acre sports and entertainment district with a new arena for the teams, broadcast facility, shopping, restaurants, and headquarters for Monumental Sports. The plan does need to be approved by Virginia lawmakers. Well, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is not giving up on the teams in the city. Hours after the announcement in Virginia, she held her own news conference about D.C.'s best final offer. I'm not sure from what I heard this morning what the Virginia process is, um, but we expect um, that it will hit some snags. Uh, and so on top of all of this, uh, we are very committed that Washington, D.C. team should play in Washington, D.C. Uh, National Landing Wizards doesn't quite have the same ring. Well, the D.C. agreement would have monumental sports extending the lease of the Capital One Arena until 2052 in exchange for $500 million over three years to renovate and modernize the facility. Well, the House has approved a resolution to authorize the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. The 20, the 221 to 212 party line vote will give Republicans more legal power to investigate the Biden family's business dealings. Democrats insist there's no evidence of wrongdoing by the president. And Oprah Winfrey was in town for the unveiling of her portrait at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can ever dream for yourself. Because of all the dreams that I had, I didn't even know there was a National Gallery. <laughs> She's shown wearing a floor-length purple gown and holding an olive branch on her estate in Montecito, California. Well, actor Andre Brower has died. He's well known for his role as Captain Holt, on the comedy series Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Brower earned an Emmy for his work as Detective Frank Pimbleton in the 1990s series Homicide Life on the Street. He also had roles on Law and Order, SUV, and in the feature films The Tuskegee Airmen and Glory. His agent said Andre Brower died on Monday after a brief illness at the age of 61. Well, here's a look at the weather now. Chilly tonight with clear skies, lows in the 20s to near 30 degrees. Tomorrow, clear skies again, highs in the mid-40s to near 50. Well, coming up, the Caps and the Wizards could have a new Virginia home in just five years. We're talking about the money and the politics at the Reporters' Roundtable. Lines are open. Give us a call, 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. Insight is next on WHUR and WHUT-TV. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT TV. WHUR and WHUT, better together. 
DC, Maryland, and Virginia, you might have noticed something a little different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I'm Angie Ange, our director of content here at WHUT. And Monday nights at 8 p.m., we like to call it Must See DMV. All your favorite shows from all your favorite creators focus solely on what makes DC, Maryland, and Virginia so special. So set your clock, and we'll catch you at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television, telling your stories on your station. Going beyond the headlines to the deeper issues. 96.3 WHUR and HUR Voices, Sirius XM Channel 141. This is the Inside Segment, where your questions and comments matter at 202-319-7810. Join the conversation. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, Sirius XM Channel 141, 96.3 HD2 and 98.3 FM, as well as WHUT-TV. This is the Inside Segment. I'm Harold Fisher. It is a big deal, a monumental deal, a $2 billion proposal to bring the Washington Capitals and the Washington Wizards to Potomac Yards in Alexandria, Virginia. If that happens five years from now, it could be a huge blow to D.C.'s downtown business district. We start tonight's conversation with Corey Griffin, chairman of the Greater Washington Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Griffin, thank you so much for talking to us. Hey, Harold. Great to hear from you, my friend. So let's start off. Obviously, this is just a proposal, but what is your reaction to it? Well, I think for us, I mean, as, as, as somebody who's sort of involved in the city at, on multiple levels, I am obviously dismayed, like many Washingtonian residents and uh, and people who are part of the business community. So, but what do you believe this could very well mean uh, for D.C. if it were to actually happen, if you could look into your your crystal ball? Yeah, I, I think obviously uh, losing uh, Monumental, both the hockey team and the Wizards, would be devastating uh, for the downtown recovery uh, that the city has been orchestrating uh, post pandemic. Uh, the city, the mayor, the council, and the business community have all been working together to design a comeback plan, a plan that would bring vitality and vibrancy back to the downtown quarter, losing the teams uh, and losing Monumental as their home um, makes that all the, the more difficult. And so uh, I am personally concerned um, as a chair of the Greater Washington Black Chamber of Commerce, I'm particularly concerned about what it means for uh, black businesses who depend on uh, the tourists, the fans that come in to enjoy uh, both concerts and and the games. And so I think this could be devastating. I hope that, and I stand ready to work with the city and the mayor and the council and others to mitigate this in whatever way we can. Um, certainly if there's any hope uh, to hold out in terms of making, turning things around, then you know we stand ready to be a part of that conversation as well. Mm. But really, uh, if I'm looking at the crystal ball, I think today's uh, event was a grand display of what seems to be a fairly strong commitment on the part of the Virginia government, both at the state level and the local level with the Alexandria Council and all of the stakeholders there. So um, I'm dismayed, I'm concerned, uh, but um, we, we want to do what we can to make certain that we mitigate any any any. Uh, uh, further damage or the possibility of our downtown going to sleep. We can't afford to have that happen. Yeah, and, you know, obviously there is the, the fan element. There is an emotional element to all of this. But you're, you're a businessman. You're in the business of business. Uh, isn't that really the bottom line here? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely about our fans. Um, and, and, and fans fans have been loyal to uh, the, the teams, even when they weren't winning. And so um, I've thought much about what this means in terms of the soul of the city, right? Um, we've, uh, we've been proud fans, even when they don't win. And, 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 but the reality is, is that 
the team being in the District of Columbia, being at the Capital One Arena, once MCI said it, um, meant a lot for the, for the recovery of the District of Columbia as we surged back from what you remember, Harold, a very long time with the, the downtown corridor being uh, a federal enclave yeah. where people came to, came to work and then they left. We didn't have vibrancy. We didn't have restaurants. We didn't have a lot of the wonderful amenities that undoubtedly uh, Monumental Sports and its predecessor company helped to bring to the District of Columbia and uh, in particular the Chinatown downtown area. So, you know, when you think about all of what that's meant for us um, in terms of our recovery from the riots of the 60s and all of the wonderful amenities that it's brought, uh, I think you have to look at it for what it is. And on its face, it is a problem to have the team to lead the city. Final question for you. Uh, Obviously, there is an element concerning public safety right now uh, in the district and specifically in uh, Chinatown and around the Gallery Place uh, Metro. How much do you believe this issue, uh, that issue played a part in this? Well, I'm a big fan of believing what people say. Um, And Ted Leosis has said very clearly that part of his decision uh, to, to move was his concerns around the public safety. So undoubtedly, we have a real problem right now with crime um, and uh, across the board. Robberies, uh, obviously carjacking, and then, you know, we saw the news reports about the some 200 plus cars that were broken into uh, during a concert a few weeks ago at uh, Capital One Arena. And so those things can be um, nuisance issues, uh, but they also go very much to people's sense of safety and security. And so in order for the city to really have a robust um, message around marketing and its ability to, to attract people to the city, we have to also um, deal squarely with the issue of our public safety. And, and if Ted says that that was part of the decision, then I believe it. Um, and I think that going forward, whatever the outcome is of this, uh, we certainly have to deal with the public safety concerns that the community has with respect to the to the to the arena. Corey Griffin, chair of the Greater uh, uh, Washington Black Chamber of Commerce, thank you so very very much for uh, having this uh, conversation uh, with us. Now to the reporters roundtable. My guests are Keith Alexander the Pulitzer Prize-winning crime and courts reporter with the Washington Post will be joined shortly by uh, Misha Green, who is the managing editor of the Washington Informer. But, Keith, let me first start with you. Uh, Surprise, surprise, Keith, or no, about this uh, Washington Capitals, Washington Wizards proposal? Not surprised at all, Howard. I, I, I talked to a lot of business owners. Um, particularly business owners who are downtown Washington, they were not surprised. Matter of fact, many of them are trying to find ways to move out of downtown Washington, mainly because of the crime. I have covered fatal shootings blocks away from the arena. I have covered uh, break-ins and, and cases involving businesses only doors down from the arena during uh, with basketball games and hockey matches. People downtown, business owners downtown, have had enough. So, no, I was not surprised at all. Hmm. Um, you know, earlier, as I was saying to uh, 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 Corey Griffin uh, with, the, with the chamber, that this is basically business. You've got the mayor offering some uh, $500 million, half a billion, versus this proposed deal of of $2 billion to move to Virginia. Uh, it, uh, money talks, Keith. Money does talk. And th- what the mayor said is that he could have that money, $500 million, as early as the spring, as opposed to waiting years for the billions of dollars. Um, so the mayor is trying to do her best. Now, remember... They were trying to get a a better arena for years. They've been saying 
that the arena is outdated. It needs to be updated. It's, so, so, some renovations need to be done. They've been trying to get a renovation on that arena for, for several years. So between that and the increased crime, now was the best time to make a move. Mm. Yes, this is all about business. They're trying to leverage their this position of, you didn't give us what we wanted. Well, guess what? Virginia is giving us what we wanted. They're giving us a safe place, and they're giving us money. You all had the opportunity for years, and you chose not to do so. That's what happened. Uh, Misha's here uh, from the Washington Informer. Uh, Misha, same thing I'm, I'm asking Keith. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, it, if not for the media, it certainly appears that the D.C. government, the, the Bowser administration, may have been surprised by this because we just saw the, these renderings didn't just pop up. That they they're, that they're talking about that we that we saw. I mean, that this has been in the works for quite some time. Yeah, you know, it. I think what is certainly important to acknowledge is that folks are taken aback, uh, and that the people uh, have really cherished the placement of the Wizards at Capital One Arena. It was such a boom for the downtown area. And while the, I I think that if people really have been paying attention to the coverage that's happening in downtown DC, downtown DC, the proof has been really in the pudding the whole time. I mean, of course, (laughs) of course we see these renderings that are quite well developed and didn't happen overnight to your point, but there has been true panic about getting development downtown and the downtown business district really getting its boom and the livelihood that it had pre-pandemic. And we see that not only is that not happening and that there's been challenges with that, but now with this new decision, there's really so much at stake. And so if we're looking at really what Mayor Bowser has been doing over the past few months and the pleas that she's doing to district residents and employers about getting back to downtown D.C., it's about so much more than revitalization. Uh, it, it is so necessary at this point. And I, yeah, go ahead, Keith. Like, 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 like you said, those, those, those uh, diagrams and those sketches and, and this whole deal that was put together, there is no way they could put this together in a vacuum <laughs> in, in days or weeks. There is no way that the Bowser administration and city council members did not know about this and has to have known about this for weeks, if not months. Well, she said at the press conference today that she did believe that uh, Monumental Sports CEO Ted Leonsis was negotiating in good faith, even though she paused when asked about that, Keith. I, I don't know whether she was trying to walk the political fence. <laughs> I mean, she would have to say that, right? I mean, they—they they are they're still in negotiations, so she doesn't want to cast aspersions on this on this man. I mean, so, so they are still in negotiations. I can see her saying that. That's not a surprise to me. 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. We are at the reporters' roundtable talking about likely one of the biggest stories of the year for yeah. Washington D.C. Indeed, the D.M.V. The proposed move of the Washington Capitals and Washington Wizards to Potomac Yards in Alexandria, Virginia. If you have a comment, if you have a question, give us a call. Lines are open 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. Dr. Perry calling from D.C. Thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Hello, Harold Fisher, MSU grad. So, <laughs> here's what I want to say. The mayor and the city manager and all those folks in charge should have seen this coming. This doesn't happen overnight. You're supposed to have spies everywhere, and you're supposed to be aware of the conversations that are taking place in your city. The reporter said it best. He's been asking for these improvements over a while. You haven't done them, and so he gets a better offer. And at the same time, you have some crime in your city. I don't want let I don't want crime to be the overarching reason because then we're going to make it black and brown and I know we're not going to break make it black and brown but the reason I said that is is that if 
the downtown area was a vibrant business district opposed to so many condos and housing and all that down there. But if you bought more attractions down there where you increase tourism and you lower some of those prices on these hotels, then you could have had a, a area that had the finances to fund anything that you want to do in that area. And I think that we have to rethink how we are structuring Washington, D.C. as more of a dense residential city and think about how do we add uh, more businesses and attractions that will keep it balanced. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Dr. Perry, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So here, here's another issue, and this happened today at the at the news conference, the mayor's news conference, where she was asked about a, the crime issue in the area, and she characterized it as a blip. Now, after that, later in the press conference, she corrected or recharacterized her comment about the blip, and this is what she said. Because I think in, the, in terms of the history of the district, we're going to look back and see that we had uh, crime increases. I presided over crime increases in the time that I've been a city council member and mayor. And when we work together to have the right policies and enforcement in place, we drive crime down and we will drive it down again. I did not mean to suggest that I don't think we have a serious situation. So let me clarify that if that's what you took from it. But I do want to put it in context of, of time and how we work to reduce crime, and we will do it again. Whew. Mm. Woo! That was close. That was close. Yeah. That's well, called, that's called backpedaling. That, no, look, Keith, and I know you know this one in, in your years of coverage. That's called capping, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's called capping. <laughs> but, 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 to give, but to give the mayor credit, she did realize that what she had said was probably was not accurate, that we that violent crime in D.C. is up historically for over several years particularly in downtown D.C. around where the arena is. And she, was, and she was wise enough to say, let me restate what I said earlier and make it very clear, because everyone knows the statistics, everyone knows the numbers, and so she was at least transparent enough to realize, okay, let me make sure that what I am saying is, is indeed clear and, and accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I think it was really important on two sides. She made it very clear that crime is certainly a priority for her. Um, but also, I think a little bit of that backpedaling was that she said, we, well, we've dealt with this when I was on the council and as mayor. Yeah. And I don't want it. I, I don't want meaning this is in the mayor's sort of words that I don't want it to make it look like I. I don't care about this in all of my time right. <laughs> in D.C. politics. Um, but I do think that one thing that's interesting is this notion about crime being here versus in the the Potomac area is access, right? I mean, Capital One Arena is in Gallery Place where there has been... Uh, you know, semblances of activity, we should say. Well, well she, well, she talked about you that know, also. I mean, your gallery place is like, it's almost like, it's like Metro Center. Yes. All of the capillaries and arteries and veins of Metro go into cal into gallery place. Right, you know, and, and, and so it's, it, 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 while the district is definitely experiencing cr a crime issue and a crime uptick, and Keith, you know, has done really wonderful coverage of this, I want to say, is that I think at the other point of that is that this is a very tricky area and a very specific part of the district which is experiencing its own transition because it's not what it was pre-COVID-19. Um, yeah. and, and so I think as they remain in conversations, at least that needs to be very clear to Ted Leonis because I think as we were 
his argument has been about crime. We got to talk about the fact that we're, we need to address crime in the district, but we also have to address issues in the district, and it's not just that. We are going to talk about that on the other side of the break, including the indictment of 10 teenagers earlier this week in an alleged carjacking conspiracy. We're also going to talk to Tish calling from D.C., Gerald calling from D.C. Lines are still open at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. We are at the Reporters Roundtable. We'll continue on Sirius XM, Channel 141 and WHUT in just a bit. John Mons is next with the original Quiet Storm. That's on WHUR. We will be back in just a minute. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT TV. WHUR and WHUT better together. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, you might have noticed something a little different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I'm Angie Ange, our director of content here at WHUT. And Monday nights at 8 p.m., we like to call it Must See DMV. All your favorite shows from all your favorite creators focus solely on what makes D.C., Maryland, and Virginia so special. So set your clock, and we'll catch you at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television, telling your stories on your station. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT-TV. I'm Harold Fisher. We are at the Reporters' Roundtable talking about the top stories of the week. My guests are Misha Green, Managing Editor of The Washington Informer, and Keith Alexander, Pulitzer Prize-winning crime and courts reporter with The Washington Post. Lines are still open at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. You can X me at H Fisher, W-H-U-R, or find me on Instagram at Harold T. Fisher. Let me go back to the phone lines. Tish calling from D.C. Thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Hey, how are you? I'm doing yeah, just so fine, thanks. Um, teams moving to Virginia. Mm-hmm. I feel like that decision or that idea probably was thought about 10 years ago, I thought it, it sounds like it's more like a plan with all the other things that are going on in the area, like Amazon, um, the new subway line. I feel like this discussion was was done years ago. Yeah. And I mm. think the area, I think the area even, even looks, seemed to be a better area to have a stadium. Hmm. Due to Virginia being bigger, you see, Virginia is a lot bigger than D.C., and most of the people that come to the games are coming from Virginia. So I, I think this, is, this, this whole experience is something they already spoke about, and now it's in, in the media. So it wasn't just thought about last week. Okay, too. I think things were thought about like probably decades ago. Mm. Tish, thank you so much for your comment. 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. Gerald. Calling from D.C. Thanks for calling, Gerald. What's on your mind? Hey, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, first of all, business owners want to own. That 70 acres that is presented to Ted Leonis, uh, that is going to be his property. He will be able to benefit from the other businesses that are going to be on that property. He can't benefit from the uh, restaurants in Chinatown, all around 8th Street, 7th Street, places like that. And the, he pays the most rent of any NBA owner in the NBA right now. So he got a big deal. That's a lifetime offer. You got to take that. Hmm. Okay, Gerald, thank you so much. Um, I, I will say to Tish's point about the possible planning of this, whether it's this particular this this particular sports venture, but if you look at what else is happening in that area? There's the Virginia Tech campus. There's there's Amazon there. We 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 already have Pentagon City there. 
the only thing that that would make me feel that would fill me with consternation is the October thirty first like traffic. <laughs> you know, it's that that's a horror show of traffic over there, Misha. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that route. Yeah, route one. Just yeah, that's, that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. It, it will only become worse. I, I mean, I think about a lot of it. The, the fact that you know, traffic is awful around the Capital One Arena right now, but the fact that there is so much access to you know, we talked about the Gallery Place Metro, there's Metro Center um, very nearby, Judiciary Square, all of that so that right. people can take the Metro. Uh, there are a lot of people who only work at Capital One Arena because it is Metro accessible. Mm -hmm. And so the, again, the, at, for those who are worried a little bit beyond we're taking the wizards out of Washington is that we're taking opportunities out of the hands of Washingtonians. Now, of course, Ted Leonis has said that these jobs will be available, but how are folks getting there um, becomes a little bit of my concern as we look forward. Well, and, and he did say that if this were to happen, that the mystics would play we'll at, they would they would play at capital one uh, arena which then begs the question so what happens to the facility that uh, the city built in southeast right um entertainment and sports arena exactly right. and so what it, all, all of this is just conjecture a proposal but if the mystics come into town some would say, you know, arguably, they have at least historically been more popular than the Wizards. Um, or more successful. Yeah, and more successful, <laughs> w w without That's a question. And, and so you know, everything affects everything else, and everything is connected, which brings me to this next point. And, and Keith, this is... Before you go, I'm sorry, before you, before you go to the next, I know the next point, just real quick, the ripple effect. If the team leaves to go to North Virginia, I guarantee you FedEx Field days will be numbered because mm. the mayor is going to be is going to do everything she can now to bring the uh, the Commanders back into D.C. Especially if there's no uh, basketball and hockey team, so FedEx Field days will definitely be numbered. Well, she said as much. She said as much that her position about bringing the Washington Commanders back into D.C. Um, those, those efforts are still underway. And then she mentioned, uh, of all things, the, the, uh, the old FBI headquarters, uh, which may be available. I, I don't, I mean, that would have to be obviously demolished and something created there. How you put a sports station right there in, in, the, in the middle of federal government center, I, I don't know. But, but she also talked about that whole campus sports campus area which is what rfk is but 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 let's not forget just because the dc council is behind this 500 million and the city of alexandria and lawmakers in richmond are behind this two billion dollars don't forget about the people who live in these areas the the people who live in what what's it called del rey for example right. in in uh, Alexandria, it, it is a bedroom community inside Alexandria. It, it is a cute as a button community. <laughs> it would not be cute as a button anymore. The it, it's not cheap to live there now, but it would become even more expensive. And you already have a, a lot of a, a groundswell of people who are saying, "Yeah, I, I really don't want this." Yeah. Oh yeah, there, there, there are flyers all over. Um, Trees and cars that say, you know, say no to, uh, to to the stadium. They, they, they're already up. They, they've been protesting this for weeks. Yeah. I, I, I do want to go to this next issue, which is, of course, connected to this. And, Keith, you, you covered this. Uh, D.C. U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves announcing the arrest of 10 teenagers and charging them with a carjacking conspiracy in D.C. and Maryland. These are not the impetuous crimes of a child who temporarily lost control. They are the calculated crime of someone willing to hold a gun to someone's head for money or property. 
I would like to speak directly to the teens, and they are primarily teens, that are fueling the crisis that we are seeing. Whoever is telling you that these carjacked vehicles are free cars, that there won't be consequences if you're caught, that you won't get caught if you're wearing a mask, is lying to you. Keith, what did he not tell us in that in that news conference? Um, good, great question. Well, first of all, these 10 individuals were not teenage, teenagers per se, as in juvenile. These were 18 and 19 year olds and the, uh, who, were, who were charged. Now, what he's saying and what, where this fusion is, is that many of these 18 year olds were juvenile at the time of the incident. Mm -hmm. So, seven of the 10 individuals who were arrested were juveniles a year or two ago when these carjacking occur, but they are now 18 and 19 year olds. So these are, these are 18 and these are, these are adults at this, at this point. Now, what's also very interesting is that these seven individuals who were teenagers at the time, years ago, they would have been charged as juveniles. But what's different now is that the prosecutors say, we are now going to charge these adults as adults, even though they committed the crime when they were juveniles. That sends a message to the community. What, what, what Graves is trying to say is, we will now treat you like the adult who you, uh, when you're acting to do an adult act. We're going to treat you like adults and charge you like an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, Misha, your thoughts? So, again, kudos to you, Keith, on your coverage of this. When I first saw the um, press release about this uh Keith and the press release were the only headlines that I saw <laughs> that did not say 10 teens. <laughs> uh, made it clear that these were 10 people, right? Uh, because there's a you know, uh, there is a level of empathy. And of course, it, and I, this was my editing, I did put 10 teens and uh, I kept that headline for us in the Washington Informer because to Keith's point that this happened when they were teenagers, but they are adults now, which right. led me into a bit of research on the pros and cons of charging young people as adults for crimes that had happened when they're juveniles. Now, of course, there are tons of cons that come when you're talking about 16, 17 year olds. These are 18 and 19 year olds, thus adults. And so uh, though the crime occurred when they were not considered adults by law, now they legally are. Um, and so some of those cons dissipate because the time in which they're serving it are as adults that said um i'm curious what and this is a journalist and citizen in me uh begging the question what will come where will the lesson be will it make a difference in charging these people as adults will the younger teens behind them learn their lesson and the answer is we really don't know this they're making an example out of this 10 person maybe more these are the 10 people who were charged ring uh and and i'm i know keith probably knows this a bit based off of his um coverage but it seems like these rings are a part of a larger organization or larger that's gangs correct. That's of correct. Uh, getting these orders from adults well that's what u.s that's, attorney that's graves it. was that's, saying yeah that's it right there it's the nail on the head that adults are using these juveniles to do these crimes because the adults are saying, hey, you just do a slap on the wrist, you'll be in uh, a youth center for about two or three weeks or two or three months, and then you'll be out. Now, what Graves is saying, those days are over. If you're caught doing this, we will charge you as an adult, just like you were 20, 22, 23 years old, and you'll be in jail seven to 15 years. That's what's different this time around. The other thing that he mentioned during this press conference, Keith, was that the new ring, if you will, to these charges is that there is a conspiracy component. Yeah. And he said that is something new, that they are trying to keep the, the alleged perpetrators of these crimes off the street. But here's the thing that I heard 
for the past several years when we've been talking about carjackings in the District of Columbia, the mayor and, and police chiefs have said, and I say police chiefs plural, they have said that there is a small group of people doing the same thing over and over again. If, if we are to assume that these suspects did indeed commit these crimes, what are the chances, Keith, that this, this particular arrest could very well make a dent in the, the rate uh, of, of carjackings that we see going forward? And th that's a great question. With conspiracy, and, you know, for your listeners who may not be familiar with what that actually means, is Graves is basically saying you might not ever was part of that car, you maybe even set foot in the car, you didn't, have, you didn't even touch, touch the, the, the car door. But if you help plan the, the theft, if you help plan the, the, the selling of the vehicle, if there's any evidence that you were part of the negotiations to coordinate, uh, hey, if there's a car on, on this corner, you should go after it. That's called conspiracy, even if you never touched the car. So that's what he's going after. That's what he's saying. Even That's why conspiracy is, is so powerful here with, with these charges. And what's also interesting is that you know, these, these young people were actually on social media discussing the cars, discussing cars that they were selling and how they got the cars, and they called it Grand Theft Auto in real time. That's amazing that they, that they, were, they, were, they were out there talking about this, this uh, crediting a, a, a video game, but they're saying this, this is a, the real world time. And, and, and so they were using an analogy of stealing cars on a video game, but they're doing it in real life. Yeah. Simply amazing. And it goes to show you these are young people, at least mentally young people. Absolutely. 202-319-7810, uh, 202-319-7810. Denise, calling from D.C. Thanks for calling, Denise. What's on your mind? Yes, my name is Denise, and I'm calling from D.C. Okay. I'm calling in reference to you talking about they say that they want to hold these youth accountable. So, I mean, you're saying that the agency or the housing placement well, you will put them at. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold, Denise, slow down. You, st start again. You said, what about the about the youth? I didn't quite understand what your point was. So I was saying that you're talking about grades. Said that these youth will be held accountable. Yes. Well, you're saying that they're going to hold them accountable. Yes. So accountability comes. Where would they be held accountable with? Like, I mean, what do you have in place to hold them accountable? You say that these youth are committing the same crimes over and over again and being released back into the community. So what's happening when you place them under the agency? What happens when you remove them from the community and they go to the YF? There definitely must be some type of breakdown in the system that these same kids are being released back in the community. Mm. All right. So what are we going to do about that? Uh, any thoughts, uh, Misha, on you know, accountability? Now, now, certainly, again, when we're talking about, for example, the, these 10 suspects, they are adults now. Right. If they are convicted as adults, they may be young people, but they may be charged and and sentenced if convicted as, a, as adults. Yeah, well, I, again, I think in this case, we're seeing where the extent of accountability can go. Whereas you might have done this as a child, but you're now playing a grown man's game. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that. And a grown, and a grown woman game. Uh, there, there some, some yeah, yeah, yes, there were. I, I, you're right. Sorry, Keith. I was using the general. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that point. Go on. No, look, look, look. Let 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 me make it very very clear. Uh, a grown man and woman's game. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but but I think that that's the question, Denise. That the DC government, that law enforcement uh, agencies, and really 
at least we're seeing these conversations around the DMV. I mean, I've, we've had conversations on your show, Harold, about Aisha Brave Boy doing the same thing in Prince George's County. This we're scratching our heads. I mean, this is a new generation of young people. These Gen Zers um, don't feel the same threat, maybe because some of these laws really aren't in place to hold them in, accountable in the way that would make them feel um, threatened uh, enough to not commit the crimes that they're doing. That said, I think that we're, we really need to evaluate how we're looking at punishment, how we're looking at the, we, we talk about this without really going deep into this school to prison pipeline. Uh, and when we're talking to young, about young people and particularly young African American people, which is who are, who's being affected uh, the most, that's a real important conversation. And so, Denise, you're right. Accountability is key. Somebody um, talked about holding parents accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and is that something that we talk about? I, I, I don't really know what the district government is going to do um, past what they're trying to do, which is raise the stakes. Yeah. I, I, will say, I, I, let me, I will say, as an aside... Uh, because Misha made an interesting point about what young people are afraid of. And during the House Judiciary, uh, the Maryland House of Delegates Judiciary Committee hearings last week, a judge testified before the, the Maryland House Judiciary Committee, and he said that, and this was, it, it was nuanced, but I found it really important. He said that juveniles who commit these kinds of crimes, carjackings, for example, are not afraid of going to jail uh, or juvenile or, or uh, juvenile detention. Right. What they are afraid of is long term probation. And I thought that was fascinating because if you send a, a juvenile to jail for a year and then he or she comes out and they may very well not turn around and they, they may commit other crimes. But if you put them on probation after they come out or not put them in, but put them on probation, then you've got this probation hanging over their heads. And if they sneeze in the wrong place, it could very well mean that they could get locked up for an extended amount of time. I don't know whether or not that is the answer, Denise, but I do find that that was a, a very, very profound thing. Keith, you also had something you wanted to add. Uh, well, no, actually, you just hit, you hit the nail on the point, but, uh, uh, on the head. But one of the things that also was very interesting is that back in October, I covered a, a fatal carjacking, and your listeners probably remember this. A 12 and a 13 year old tried to carjack um, a security guard, and the security guard shot and killed the 13 year old. This happened three blocks from Cap Arena. Right. Three blocks from Cap Arena. 12 and 13 year old carjacking. And we're not even talking 16, 17. We're talking 12 and 13 year olds. Somebody, a child who's not even a teenager yet. And this is what they're doing. This is they are being used by adults to do these very things. And to go to your point, if they are sentenced to so to to a, to a youth shelter, they can only get but so much time. If there's you no know, if, if they're if they're 16 or 17, it's rare that a judge is going to sentence a, a, a teenager until they're 21 for a carjacking. Usually, those sentences are reserved for for homicide. So oftentimes these kids are in and out these juvenile detention centers within months, two or three months at the most. Yeah, and and just to and to you know put a fine point on it, and there's this uh, this story that uh, you know that we they also just came out earlier this week. This was in Richmond, Virginia, that an an 11 year old girl has been accused, I'm sorry, an 11-year-old boy has been accused of carjacking a DoorDash driver with the help of an 18-year-old. And so I think this does go back to what 
yep. uh, the D.C.'s U.S. attorney says about, you know, older teens um, bringing you younger, younger teens, people yep. in into this this crime space. So, Denise, again, uh, thank you so much for your for your comment. Let me go to Dorothy calling from Maryland. Thanks for calling, Dorothy. What's on your mind? Okay. I'm calling because I am one of the people that are so so aggravated with all of this crime with these kids running around here uh, doing all of this stuff. Where do they live? Where are their parents? What time of day and night are they being accounted for? You know, it just does not make sense. And I don't care if they can. They are supposed to be in their house, in their home. Their mothers and fathers need to know where they are. All of this throwing money at them and all this game, all the, oh, I am so, oh, I just get so sick of it. I know kids that have died and you know, it just does not make sense. And when I see a parent on TV who has lost their child and they stand up there trying to make sense of it, and, oh. Yeah. You, you know, Dorothy, think- I, I will say that there are a lot of people in the DMV who are frustrated just as as you are. And the concerns that you are echoing about parental responsibility, uh, better parenting, but I think the the reality is is that uh, a lot of times these young people don't know where their parents are. Yeah. And then yep. in some cases, the parents, responsible, hardworking parents, don't know where their children are, and which goes back to, to the case that Keith just brought up about the Capital One federal security officer who was carjacked. The the 13-year-old was killed, but the 12-year-old was turned in by his it's mother. Mother, yep. That's right. Yeah. So uh, it, it is a complicated and frustrating situation, Dorothy, one that we are continuing to keep our ear to the ground about. Here is... Another issue that is related to all of this, and that is another big money issue, Misha, $750 million deficit for Metro and General Manager Randy Clark kind of laying out a worst case scenario this week. Boy, that's enough to make a lot of people sweat. It's a whole lot to make. <laughs> Just, I mean, tons of people sweat. I, I, moment of silence always for Metro because mm-hmm. they really do <laughs> try. <and> I, <laughs> I just don't, I don't want to talk bad about their con- continued challenges, but this financial deficit for me is so confusing. And, and Keith, get, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember a few years ago when we were in a surplus transportation why specifically Washington DC metros you were one of the people covering the the students who were jumping the turnstiles uh, at the time is is that correct no I no um, I was not okay. this, this is a homicide case or a carjacking I wasn't I wasn't doing this. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, yeah, so, blood and guts. okay, so I remember, okay, the, uh, 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 luckily the, it wasn't that, but I remember I was in the studio at least talking about this with you, Harold, and I thought Keith was here, uh, but about this surplus, right, that, that the met- Metro has been in for, I thought, over, over uh, at least over five years, and so I'm really shocked now <laughs> to see that now th- there's financial challenges, so much so that we're looking at o- almost 70 bus lines being cut. Well, Randy Clark will say that part of this is uh, the, the loss during the pandemic. Of course. He's, go- he's going to say that, but also, and... And for those of us who have been here a really, really long time, such as myself, um, we also know that uh, Metro put off delayed repairs uh, for for years and years and years. This is 
the, we're we're talking things that happened back in the 80s and 90s that right. Metro did not address. On top of then challenges that they had to right, exactly. a, a panic like address which then cost far more money without planning. And the chickens now have come home to roost. Correct. If if you if you don't fix the little things in your house when they break and then something big breaks like the uh, what the seven hundred seven thousand series trains with their with their with their brake issues, then you're going to focus on that. But those other things are still broken, and they have to be paid for, and you have to pay people to do that. And as the city begins to evolve, begins to change, uh, begins to expand, uh, the, none of that is cheap. And while Keith Randy Clark said that this is a worst case scenario, the the thought that more than 2,000 people could be laid off, cutting bus routes, and, and, and cutting Metro yeah, during the week a, at 10 o'clock at night. Just, that, and, and, that's serious stuff. At the same time, now, is there any question that, uh, that Leona's going to take uh, the Wizards and the Cats out of, the, out of, out of downtown D.C. because people won't, won't even be able to get, go to the game? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 riff, the ripple effect is... is, is, is it, 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 it's astounding. It really is. And yes, you talk about. I mean, Metro has been a mainstay employer of Black and Brown people in in, in, the, in, the, in, in DC for decades. And it is. It was. You know, either you work for the government. A lot of people was either you get a government job or you get a Metro job. Those were the, those provided great middle middle class, middle income uh, uh, jobs for families. And to be losing these many jobs, it just cut so many routes. And I, and I guarantee you. The routes that are going to be cut, we know what part of town those routes are going to, are, are going to be gone. We oh, absolutely. Um, the ripple effect is insane. Is uh, w The district particularly this week has been super focused on absenteeism, for example, in D.C. public schools. Uh, yet, transportation, metro <laughs> is key for district public school students getting to school. And so cutting those lines would particularly, again, we're talking almost 70 uh, bus lines and I think almost 10 metro stations could be affected. We know, as Keith said, who's going to be affected, who's going to get cut in access and getting to some of the places that they have to go, such as school and work. Uh, but, but again, I'm really anxious to get down to the bottom of some of these numbers and interrogate where you know what where these funds are going i know of mm -hmm. course we have lines that uh are, are are being built and worked on and efficiency is key as harold said there are a lot of different things that have been over decades needing to get addressed in, in metro but again I, I have a very vivid memory of uh government leaders saying metro's doing well yeah. what's going on well we will continue to we will continue to watch that uh we are out of time but misha green keith alexander always a pleasure to have you on the program thank you yes, so sir. much sure thank, thank you. you and finally tonight about the proposed move of the wizards and caps to alexandria virginia this is not about the fans this is not about D.C. teams playing in D.C. It is about business, and it could happen. Now, you may remember the Baltimore Bullets moved to the old Capitol Center in Prince George's County and became the Washington Bullets, then the Washington Wizards, and then they moved to D.C. in 1997. The Skins moved from RFK to FedEx Field. D.C. is trying to bring them back. Caps and Wizards fans, you may not like the thought of teams moving. But think about this, $500 million to stay in your old house or $2 billion to move to a new house in a new neighborhood. It could happen. Brace yourselves. That's the Daily Show. This program this was produced by WA2T and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.